Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and the brightest in the world of business, marketing, sports, and entrepreneurship to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. My guest today has often had the uh, pleasure of being mistaken for a young Tom Cruise, something I wish I could say myself. No, just kidding. On a serious note, we're joined by legendary sports agent Lee Steinberg of Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. I'm thrilled to have him on the podcast today. And besides being the inspiration, Behind the movie Jerry Maguire, Lee has been the real-life powerhouse behind countless NFL athlete successes, racking up 64 NFL first-round draft picks. Is that number still correct, 64? Yes, it is. <laughs> of which eight were picked number one overall. That's incredible. I want everyone to think about that for a second. And he started with his career with a bang back in 1975 with his first client, Steve Bartoski, was picked first overall in the draft. Do we call that beginner's luck or fate? We'll get to that in a little bit. And he founded SSE and has seen it all since through the ups and downs of his life and his career. And he has truly reinvented himself and has had top talent such as Pat Mahomes, Kareem Hunt on his roster today. A ton of sports royalty and tenacity to dig into on this one. I'm excited. I did a boatload of preparation on this one, so I actually know what the heck I'm talking about. Let's do this. Lee Steinberg, thank you and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. I really greatly appreciate you coming on the show today. So let's let's jump in, and we could go back to the early days at Berkeley, where you served as president of student government, uh, and you were protesting the Vietnam War. And I'm really curious how this really shaped your future success. Um, what was your relationship with Ronald Reagan back then, and how did that change over time? Let's dig into that a little bit, because I listened to a ton of uh, podcasts and interviews, and I really didn't hear too much about the the real early Berkeley days. <clears throat> so Berkeley at that point was the center of student life and activism in the country. And the war in Vietnam was going on, and many people felt that it was not a good use of American lives. So protests were happening all the time. Ronald Reagan was elected governor of California, and uh, his popularity was in part based on keeping the campuses uh, from exploding. And so I was soon my president. He's governor. We have to interact all the time after uh, protests. And I learned everything I needed to learn about the art of negotiating from dealing with then governor, later president, Ronald Reagan. And um, we sort of duped it out at different times. And um, later, we laughed about it, but at that particular really? point, it, it was wow. less humorous. Did he, did he teach you anything about showmanship? Um, well, he was all showmanship. Um, but again, being sued by a president at Berkeley at that particular time was being like the governor of a, of a state. It was, we had changes in in dress and and music and uh, sexual mores and in <clears throat> the use of herbal substances and there were a variety of things that were <clears throat> were changing the whole culture and it was being resisted um, so Ronald Reagan was the essence of showmanship and I love it and a great speaker and understood uh, how to reach people. And uh, and even though he was a conservative Republican, he, he won landslide votes. 
So was it at Berkeley, you know, did you always kind of have the sports itch? I mean, were you always a sports fan? Did you always feel like sports was going to lead to business or really wasn't until you kind of connected with Steve? So um, I had grown up in Los Angeles and my dad took us to the Dodger games and the Ram games and he was a big UCLA alum so that uh, I was brought up as a Bruin baby and so we love sports. I ran track and cross country but I never conceptualized it as a career. Uh, My dad had two core values uh, outside of spiritual ones. One was make a prioritize relationships, especially family. And the second was to go out and make a meaningful, positive difference in the world and help people who couldn't help themselves. So I was much more oriented to being a a civil rights or civil liberties uh, attorney fighting for people or a criminal attorney, you know, fighting for the downtrodden um, and there really was no field of sports agentry at that time to aspire to there was no right to be represented so when I began a team mm-hmm. could simply click the phone down and say we don't deal with agents That's it. so uh, there was nothing to aspire to so when I was a dorm counselor in an undergraduate dorm, they moved the freshman football team into the dorm, and one of the students was Steve Bartkowski. It was an interesting dorm. I was dorm counselor. We also had a young guy named Steve, a bearded fellow who was really bright. Steve Wozniak went down to San Jose and and with the other Steve formed Apple Computers. And, oh, that guy, that yeah, guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> wow, what a dorm. Let's just talk about the firepower in that dorm for a moment, right? That's insane. Well, there also was a, a fellow named Brian Maxwell who went out and founded uh, Power Bar and wow. uh, came up with that and ran that company. And there was Rob, Rob Swenson, who was an all-pro um, linebacker with the Denver Broncos. Um, but anyway, Bartkowski gets picked number one in the country in 1975, and um, he's struggling in his negotiations, and he asked me to represent him. Is, so, that, is that just how it happened? He he trusted you. He knew you, and you were you were still undergrad at that time, or were you in law school? No, I had graduated, and so I had left law school and traveled around the world for over a year. And then when I got back, uh, I was choosing between different jobs, and but this was. Um, like February of 1975, and the draft had been in January, and Bart asked me to represent him, and uh, that was 47 years ago. Wow, that's that that's absolutely incredible. So, you, so you're like, wait a minute, I'm onto something here. I could combine my love of sports. You have a knack of negotiating that you learned from then Governor Reagan, and you're putting this all together. But even at that time, as you mentioned, like the sports agents really weren't quite a thing, right? Like it wasn't ubiquitous now it wasn't you know jerry Maguire and entourage and all these other movies and what's that show that the rock does right like it wasn't what it is today not even close to it no. i mean did you envision it as a career so um what i saw in the very first experience was that Bartkowski and I flew into Atlanta the night before the signing, and we get to the airport, and there are cleat lights flashing in the sky like for a movie premiere. A huge crowd is pressed up against the police line, and the first thing we hear is, we interrupt the evening news to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and his attorney have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switch you live for an in-depth interview. So... I saw then that athletes could be role models and that they were the celebrities and they were the movie stars in communities across the country. And I felt like I could combine my dad's values by having them go back each athlete and retrace their roots and set up a scholarship fund at the high school or work with a boys and girls club or a church and at the collegiate level rebond with those uh, alums who could be mentors so let's Troy Aikman endowed a full scholarship at uh, UCLA at the professional level we 
I challenge each of them to set up a charitable foundation that would attack some problem that was near and dear to their heart. So, and then we would take the leading business figures, political figures, and community leaders and put them on a board, and they could help execute a program. So that's we're done putting a, the 175th single mother and her family into the first home she'll have her own by making the down payment and having the house outfitted. It's athletes changing lives or giving back truly yes. giving back right and or, or patrick mahomes with his 15 in the mahomes uh which helps youth charities and uh you know buys lunches for school kids it's it's incredible and 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 while doing my research that's something that really resonated with me deeply that you've always kept through your ups and your downs and we'll, we'll get to the downs in a little bit but you've always kept that true to the values with yourself and with your athletes and what's really pulled you through. It's an incredibly, incredibly admirable. Let, let's dig in. Early days of the agency. Business is booming. You have these draft picks. The world is on fire. Life is moving extremely fast. Was there one key mistake you made from a business perspective looking back on it now? One maybe kind of, we'll call it a rookie mistake, right? We'll call it a rookie mistake business-wise that you look back on. And, you know, at the time it could have been detrimental but it, and, and a terrible uh, lesson to learn the hard way. But you look back on it and you know, thank God I had that experience. So I'm representing Bartkowski. We do the biggest contract in the history of sports. And now the next year, there's no model. So I talked to a large group of players, spend a lot of money traveling around and have modest results. I mean, you know, I had second rounders, some good players, but not quite at the same level. And I realized that I was going to have to change my methodology and that a certain type of family and a certain type of young man would be interested in the whole concept of role modeling, second career. And I needed to start to research athletes. And what I found was in doing that, in checking did this young uh, uh, undergrad go to Haiti on a mission? Did he uh, help in the inner city? Does he have a history of this? What's the family look like? Right. And by doing that, um, out of 10 players I talked to, I might sign eight. If I talk to 100 players, I might sign four. So the point was I had to make an adjustment um, to understanding that only a certain type of person would be uh, interested in this. And those were the people I wanted to spend my life uh yeah, helping, helping, and so there were. So it was a fundamental shift. Had I continued to do the other, um, I probably would have gone bankrupt. How do you how do you assess? I mean, you've met so many people in your life. We're not just talking professionally, personally, but how do you assess character quickly in an initial conversation? Do you have like kind of your tells, or is it more of like a, a gut instinctly? No, I asked someone to. Um, talk about their values and priorities. So I say short-term economic gain, one priority. Long-term economic security, family, uh, spiritual considerations, geographical considerations, making a difference in the world, um, uh, profile. Um, and then obviously for an athlete, being a starter, being on a winning team, the quality of coaching, the system they play, and the facilities. So by asking someone, look, Adam, the most important thing in in life to me is listening skills. If you can draw another person out and cut below the surface to get to their deepest anxieties and fears and their greatest hopes and dreams. And men especially don't share so easily. So you have to create a climate. Oh, athletes too. You have to create a climate of trust. And then you have to get to the inner person beyond the surface responses. So how I assessed it was by interacting with a family and parents, which normally was the first step, and then then the young athlete themselves. So instead of generically uh, presenting the same concept to everyone, it was totally tailored to that person's wants and needs. 
and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I think, uh, what, what did I, what did I read? I think it was eight to 10 conversations and meetings with Pat Mahomes family before I even spoke to him. Yes. So right. ge- that proves the point. So generally it will be the parents who are the screeners in the situation. And I might talk to parents 10, 15 times before ever meeting the athlete because they have plenty to do and uh, their last year of college between academics and the rest of it. That And there are a thousand certified agents. So, of course. Um, at any rate, it's listening. It's drawing another person out. And if you can put yourself in another human being's heart and mind and see the world the way they see it from their perspective, you can navigate your way through life gracefully. Pause on that for a moment, everybody. Let let that sink in for a little bit. And there, there's so much content and podcasts out there. I I, I checked out the real sports uh, interview the other day. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say if anybody really wants to dig in into this middle ground there, check out the other stuff. I want to save my time with Lee to dig into some things that that I really want to get to here. Um, let's talk quickly about you know uh, the movie Jerry Maguire, synonymous more or less with with your life there. What what was what was the prep like for that movie? Um, I believe that. Um, the team, you know, Cameron Crowe, he followed you around for what, 18 months? Yes. He uh, saw so everything the, the good, the bad, the ugly, the dirty, the clean, the good stuff, right? Everything. Well, Cameron called me up in 1993 and asked if I'd be willing to let him be a fly on the wall and follow me into situations to do a, a film based on a sports agent. So I took him with me to uh, Palm Desert where he got to observe the NFL meetings and owners and GMs and coaches. And as I was walking players around and he met some of the figures, he was a fly in the wall all the time. And I told him stories. Then he went to the draft, the NFL draft in 1993 with me, where I had Drew Bledsoe as the first pick. He went to pro scouting day where they test the, college draftees at USC, came to a series of games, came to my Super Bowl party, um, uh, sat in my office, and I told him lots and lots of stories. So that was step one. Step two was uh, I became technical advisor to the film, was to vet the script to make sure the willing suspension of disbelief that holds you in a motion picture didn't get broken. You didn't think that the dialogue was stilted or phony or stereotypical. You didn't think that the look of it for any true sports fan was wrong. So that was my next job. And then after that, I had to take the, uh, took some of the actors and tried to put them in role. I took Cuba Gooding Jr. down to the Super Bowl in Phoenix and made him pretend that he was my client and he hung out he hung <laughs> method out. acting real method acting right, right. there <laughs> he hung out with Desmond Howard and Amani Toomer and so and and basically did did that so it's been 25 years and I rarely go out to an airport or to dinner somewhere where someone doesn't run up to the table and say uh either say those four words to me or ask me to say what starts with show me the yep <laughs> let me did, did um you spend some time with tom cruise what did, did. What, what, what did you learn from him um as a profession as a professional he's got a very complex life and um what you can learn from him is his ability to focus and it's the same thing as an expert athlete needs, which is so the quarterback's thrown two interceptions, the crowd is booing, the game is getting out of hand. What does he do now? Can he compartmentalize that experience, adopt a quiet mind, and elevate his level of play in the critical moment to take a team to and through victory? Well, Tom Cruise has the ability notwithstanding dozens of things swirling around him to stay focused and in the moment. Yeah, incredible. I've heard that. But he's one of the hardest working actors ever out there. So, Lee, did the, did the movie hurt your career or help your career? 
Oh, I, I think it helped. Um, I think it helped humanize sports agents for people who previously thought just stereotype, you know, multiple jewelry and rings Sharks. and slip hair and and fast talking and show the real caring there is in these relationships. I mean, there's a lot of synergy between us recruiters and sports agents, maybe a little bit different in the compensation in, in some levels. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so pre-sobriety, uh, what would you say was the peak of your career? Was there, is there that, that one top of the mountain moment for you? Uh, there were several. One was Troy Aikman winning his first Super Bowl. And walking onto the field, and he's a very good quarterback, Troy Aikman. And walking out after they beat the Bills, and he's Troy Aikman, uh, name and lights. Um, another time was Steve Young, who had been in the shadow of Joe Montana for the 49ers. And they play in the Super Bowl against the Chargers. He throws six touchdown passes. Monster. I, I get down on the field after the game and he runs up and hugs me and says, the monkey's off my back, the <laughs> monkey's off my back. And then um, the great honor of presenting Warren Moon being hit, uh, giving his like nominating speech at the Hall of Fame in Canton. And he becomes the first um, African-American athlete in the modern era to uh, be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And, we had been together, been together for 23 years. We sort of grew up together. And so watching the, the fruition of his career, the, the high point was uh, thrilling. That's unbelievable. What, 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 was, it, was it purposeful in your career to stay focused on football and not so much other sports? No, we went into baseball and had a large baseball practice with my partner, uh, Jeff Morad. And we ended up having 60 baseball players, uh, Will Clark and Matt Williams uh, in another era, Pudge Rodriguez, Sean Green, Pudge. Um, uh, Manny Ramirez. Um, we we had and then in basketball I did about four lottery picks and then represented um uh olympic people that came back like brian Baitano, who was the olympic skater that won the gold medal carrie strug who stuck a vault in women's uh gymnastics in boxing i represented lennox lewis uh the heavyweight champ and he was impressive and oscar de la Rea. um but my goal there was to get them to become their own promoters and take ownership and empowerment over their own lives. So success came, and with great success came wealth, came vices, came stress, came the other side, the dark side of life. And you found yourself, Lee, in what I call the ship pit, the lowest <laughs> points of your life. And correct me if I'm wrong, Lee, but the treasures are really found in those ship pits. When you're at the lowest, and you have nothing else and you, have, you lose everything. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, you relationships, passing of your father and everything was going downhill and you were down in that moment and you had to look up. How'd you pull yourself out of it? Well, the first thing was nothing in work ever stressed me out. The stereotype of, uh, of I go in the office every day expecting there'll be reverses. We won't win everything. We uh, uh, Life. You, all the planning you do uh, will, will not prevent some hideous uh, result from happening. I expect that. It was in my private life where my father died a long death of cancer. My two older sons uh, were diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, which leads to blindness and um and losing a home to mold. And um, it were those things I felt powerless and in a way to protect my family. And, um, um, and I turned to the wrong thing. I turned to alcohol. And <clears throat> I was sitting um, on my father's bed in Los Angeles. And my only cogent thought was where I could find more vodka. And I had an epiphany of proportionality and realize 
what am I doing? I am not a starving peasant in Darfur. I don't have the last name Steinberg in Nazi Germany in the late 30s. I'm, I don't have cancer. I'm not sick. What right do I have to be just squandering time this way? And, um, and I made a pledge that if all that happened from that point on was I maintained sobriety and worked with a 12-step program with a unique fellowship um, and was a good father, that would be enough. And anything else that came along. So it was just focusing on the fact there were programs that help with uh, addiction and um Instead of telling everybody I've got it this time, I now I'm you know healed. Uh, I just stack the days up, and so and just good, good on you. Today. And then then at a certain point, I had to start a business, and I knew there'd be skepticism um, and lots of questions. And- and let's just pause right there for folks that don't know Lee, Lee's story at that time. I mean, he lost two thirds of his clients, half of his employees. There was allegations that were since proven, uh, you know, incorrect. He had a, for, for lack of a better term, a falling out with, uh, you know, his protege, David Dunn. Are you, um, have you forgiven him? Or do you guys talk at all? I mean, where are you in that relationship with David? I just, um, um, I was so disappointed at, at the, but that was 20 years ago, so I moved on from that moment. I just, um, it, you know, is is a thing that happened that you wish didn't, but um, it's not part of my present consciousness. So, I mean, let's let's take a lesson there for folks who are in business relationships, because I think this applies to so many, Lee, correct, who, are, who have a partnership or have, you know, someone underneath them coming their way up and they take a piece of business for them. How, I mean, is it even possible, people say, you know, separate work and business, right? Business isn't personal. I mean, how, business is personal, but how, how could you reconcile that? How could someone, what are some of those mental steps you could take to separate it? Is it a perspective thing? Like you said before, I have my health, I have my family, I have things that are important to me. Like it's how do you even a, start it, to put your head around it, that? It, it's also to understand that who gets hurt from a resentment, who gets hurt from that is the person with the resentment. And so in order to to heal, in order to be able to be functional and stay in this moment and not be haunted by the past or anxious about the future, um, when I'm talking to you, every ounce of energy I have is going into this moment. I'm not worrying about my schedule or my phone or anything else. So we'll share this time together and get the most out of it and then when it's time to do the next thing i'll do the next thing so the point point was that um um, the concept look you have to know this in business if you have really invaluable employees then to keep them involved they need the same thing that that you do which is recognition um, equity, a stake in, in the ongoing uh, enterprise, and uh, uh, and grant them that. In that case, I had. And so I thought I had done the best thing I could for everyone's future. But, you know, it, it, we ended up in a sale where we sold to a larger firm, and that not anything between me and and the other agents is what led to the outside pressures. So, but you have to move past that. Life is always going to have reverses. So the key is, can you be resilient? Yes. Can you bounce back? So it's only human to get to get shocked or set back by certain circumstances. But once that happens. Can you reset yourself and focus on this moment, this time, and what is about to happen? So I live in the moment, and uh, it doesn't mean I don't do planning, but I live in this moment, and um, 
um, I didn't have big doubts about whether or not I could succeed again in sports representation. Um, and that all happened, but my real comeback was being a good father and, and staying sober. It's, the, 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 it goes back to your roots from day one of doing things the right way all the time and karma and values and being true to yourself, which, which, which brought you back in the right direction. And the energy you put out, Lee, came back to you. What was that first big break? What was that first second big break when you were making your big comeback? I mean, what a great sports story here, right? Like, this is a real movie. This is a comeback story here. This is the good stuff. What was that first big break uh, on your on your, on your your comeback tour? So, um, so I had um, started back towards sobriety in 2010. But I thought I would wait for a series of years to make sure that everything was totally stable and uh, the rest of it. And then a group approached me from Houston, a fellow named Scott Irwin, and and um, uh, uh, mostly oil men, and they wanted to fund me to get back into it. And so, and they understood everything about what I had been through and where I was. Um, in 2016, uh, we signed Paxton Lynch, who was a first round quarterback out of Memphis. And that really was the breakthrough because I had always been known as a quarterback agent and had endless amounts of quarterbacks. So that was the breakthrough. Um, Paxton Lynch, and then the next year we signed Patrick Mahomes, and um, and then followed that with two Tua Tango Vailoa, and 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 uh, we have a quarterback starting for Washington now named Taylor Heineke, and um, and a practice field not too shabby great, with with great young players. Uh, just a random question: Do do you play fantasy football? <laughs> I, no, I don't do anything that involves gambling. Not, not no vices. Because I came through the era where the biggest fear in sports was that somehow an athlete would get involved in gambling, be blackmailed, right. shave his performance, and then you wouldn't have the fan support you have. Conflict of interest, be like wrestling. It'd be a conflict. Of, uh, Random question here. Do you think Pete Rose should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame? Has anyone ever even asked you that? Um, yes. No, um, I thought I had an exclusive here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no. um, um, what, what, what gets hard in that situation is that we don't expect people to be perfect. I mean, people are going to have their different flaws, but he bet on Dallas's. baseball he, as a manager on his own team. Um, but I guess at a certain level, you know, life's about forgiveness and life's about moving on. So um, I think as time passes, uh, we can recognize him for the you know, amazing player he was. And and um, and I, I think, this, you know, he made mistakes, so we've all made mistakes. So eventually you just have to give him a pass and say um, he's it's, – it's time for him to be in the Hall of Fame. Interesting. So let's talk about Pat Mahomes for a moment, and let's talk current events. He, he, the last two games that he's had, and we're recording the show on the 13th of October, in my air about four weeks from now, and I, I am pretty confident that Pat's going to turn it around, but the last two games have not been his best. We'll just say that. But the thing that stood out to me, he took full accountability. Full accountability. I heard the press conferences, and I'm like, holy shit, I'm talking to Lee in a, in a little bit, and he just had this press conference. I mean, does anything speak more volumes about what kind of person and character that he is that he didn't put the blame on others? He didn't blame the reps. He didn't blame the weather. He didn't blame his receivers, his, his O-line. He took that upon himself. What did you feel when you heard him after the press conference? Well, that's just who he is. He's grounded. He takes responsibility. He uh, is a leader. And um, look, the, it's not like he plays defense. Um, the uh, yeah. he, it's a natural, mm -hmm. intuitive, grounded yeah. sense where 
He doesn't get too high or too low. And he takes responsibility. Well, that's great because the other players know that he's got their back. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's true leadership. Right. I mean, that's that's what leadership really is. And I mean, it, 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 it's epic. Let me ask you this without getting into too much detail. What what was that deciding factor, in your opinion, why Pat signed with you? Um, I, uh, the screening process that his parents did, his father was a former baseball pitcher who had been a relief pitcher for many oh, years. And he, he was aware of, of what we had done in, in baseball. And it was a values match that this was a young man who, who was going to be successful in anything he did. It w- would be a natural role model. He had a big heart. He cares a lot about other people. Adam, if you were with him, his first question would be, how are you doing? So he's very outward oriented that way. And um, um, and the values just matched up. So when we talked about could he retrace his roots, he was all in and his parents were all in. And we talked about and then, mm-hmm. and then how bright he is. Um, and, and, you know, he talked about the fact that he thought about going to law school. And he, he, we've been able to get help him with Chris Cabot, our um, CEO and younger attorney, um, to do all sorts of things. Uh, he bought into the Kansas City Royal Baseball team, the local soccer, back in the community. soccer team. He's, right. he's been of Kansas City. Let me let me ask you, let's switch gears for a moment here. And going back to your roots, you know, social justice has always been at the heart of it, advising players there in this day and age. How do you um, guide what's kind of like your approach to guiding your athletes to align with the right social justice causes and, and really make meaningful change? Is there, is there a is there a formula to it or is it could really go back to the values and really aligning best on values and the best philanthropy? Again, it, it's the concept If you're trying to empower an athlete, the enemy for athletes is self-absorption. Enough about me. Can we talk about how you feel about me? You know, it's walking into a room and being passive. We try to teach athletes how to network, how to be outward looking. And part of it is they're citizens in a larger society. So when social problems uh, come along, they have every right and responsibility to speak out on them. Um, But you have to be tactical in terms of, do you give a speech? Do you go to a rally? Can you actually do something more than just expressing your opinion? Can you tell if the root problem is uh, bad police shootings and and conditions in the inner city? Can you think of a program that you could do that would have police interacting with the community or where your celebrity could help? Um, uh, can you? think of a way to go back into the inner city and do something because at a certain level people can talk really easily about causes what are you doing what's the action exactly and speaking of action you know you think about not just on the field but off the field and representation of african americans in the front office uh more minority gms and owners um what do you see being done? You know, what, what action can be taken and, and more than just a, a you know, a, a token hire or, you know, putting this person in as head of DEI, like what, what steps can and should they be making? Well, first of all, um, the NFL did respond and did give money and focus. I think athletes are incredible role models and they trigger imitative behavior. So it's everything from, you know, PSAs, public service announcements and and messaging. Um, it's when I had Lennox Lewis do a public service announcement that said, real men don't hit women. It could do more to change attitudes towards domestic uh, violence in rebellious right. adolescence and a thousand authority figures ever could. In terms of getting more personnel, 
in into front offices and the rest of it, you have to start younger. You have to start bringing in diversity uh, when people first start to work for a company and get them to the point where they're naturally going to, it was like with black quarterbacks, we needed to have enough black college quarterbacks playing pro set, not spread or something else to get, get to the point where you can do it. So you want to create a big a pool as you can of talent so that it's representative of, of you know, the country and the sport. Yeah, it's tremendous. And you've been a huge proponent proponent of health and wellness of the players, concussion protocol, safety, uh, and, and now with COVID. I mean, what's your general consensus? I mean, should every player be vaccinated and, and tested? And what are your thoughts? Oh, I think that sports, again, well, testing, obviously, sports but... can, again, can be a model for how to deal with things. Um, you know, it's it's difficult for someone who doesn't want to be vaccinated or has a certain stance to convince them or change their mind and you have to respect every person's right to make the decision but at the same time athletes have an extra added responsibility because people do emulate their behavior so my hope would be that every athlete would be vaccinated that every athlete would try to uh, encourage other people to be vaccinated without getting into the intense controversy over Politics. vaccinations and mass and and the things that are dividing the country. Yeah, I mean, we could park politics aside, but if you think about it, why don't we have measles, mumps, rubella, all these childhood, you know, the, all these things are going to vaccinate and we eradicate it. So the way I look at it is that when I was a kid in the 1950s, there were people my age walking around with crutches because they had polio. polio. Mm-hmm. And the Salk and Sabin vaccines eliminated it. There were people that had TB uh, and would go to convalescent homes. Somehow that got uh, eradicated. If you think more deeply, had not we had a vaccine against smallpox, the entire human species might well have gone extinct. So I guess I I respect that people have their own point of view, but in my mind, um, thank goodness for uh, vaccinations. Yeah, thank God. Um, so switching gears a little bit, what have you seen as the most promising advance in, in the technology of player safety in the NFL? Um, I think it's... Uh, I had a crisis of conscience back in the late 1980s because my quarterbacks kept getting hit in the head. We go to doctors and ask how many is the right amount and when should you quit and what are the long-term consequences and no doctors could tell us. And so I started holding concussion conferences and uh, with leading neurologists from across the country. And uh, at this year's Super Bowl party, we'll be having number 17. So the 17, you know, and it, it's everything from being careful about young kids being involved in collision sport because their brain's still in development. Right. It's thinking about a sport like football. Can you eliminate hitting, blocking, and tackling in practice? and in training camp so the only hitting occurs in the game that would knock out 40 percent and then are there ways to heal the brain one really promising technology is called rtms and it's uh electricity going in the brain and 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 i'm not a doctor i can't uh, validate any of this uh, but it seems to be promising so we have to keep uh, is there ever going to be a helmet that does more than protect against skull fracture Um, so so many different steps and Adam if you think about it it's not just pro football it's college and high school and and hockey and field hockey and and any contact sport and kids uh, uh, heading the ball in AYSO soccer which is not good yeah that's a tough one so let's let's bring it home here Lee when when you think about one day your, your time on this earth is going to come to an end. What do you, how do you want to be remembered? How, what do you want your legacy to be? 
Um, as a, a good father, a good son, uh, a good friend to people when it wasn't convenient to be a friend, uh, when it might cost something because your friend's in crisis. Um, and then did I do my best to have a make a meaningful impact and help people who couldn't help themselves? Did I care about sex trafficking and domestic violence and racism and bullying and and the environment um, and and try to put together programs that could address those issues? And what you can do is just keep trying and keep consistently uh, working on ways to make life better for people. Being a, being a real change maker. And Lee, what is, what is the single greatest piece of advice that you've ever received that you take action on every single day? Um, so my dad used to say to me, when you're looking for someone to make a change or solve a problem, and that could be as minor as picking something up off the floor that's trash, or as major as putting together, which we did, a Sporting Green Alliance to, to put sports in the forefront of uh, rolling back climate change. But when you're looking for someone, your tendency will be to look to they or them the amorphous they, the older people, political figures. And he would say, you could wait forever uh, for someone to address things. The they that's supposed to solve this is you, son. You are the they. And so it, it gave me a sense that I was my brother and sister's keeper, that, that I had to uh, try to make this life meaningful um, and that um, the, the real value in life at the end of it was how you were in relationships and whether or not you tried to make a difference. And last but not least, Lee, thank, and thank you so much for opening up and your vulnerability and sharing so much with the world here. And last, last but not least, you know, you, you look back on your life and you look back at the highs and the lows and you look back at that lowest moment, which I heard was when you were in that diaper in the hospital at the worst point of your alcoholism and you really had to pull yourself up and you lost so much and you had to harness that inner tenacity that you have in spades more than so many other people on this planet and find it and harness it and see that north star and see that compass and on the flip side you're sitting here you're healthy you're building your business life is going in the right direction and you want to show gratitude what keeps you focused what is your compass lee steinberg what is your north star in life it's a sense of optimism it's a sense of um, of appreciation for all the blessings i've been granted but it's also a sense of optimism in other words um i was brought up in a way where if there's a barn filled with defecation and that's all you can see uh there's got to be a pony in there somewhere right if you can find it and like sisyphus pushing the ball up the hill in the greek uh, legend and every time it goes up it, it rolls back you just have to uh uh, have faith that uh, things will work out and and life can be happy and uh, uh, a, a fundamental belief that life is good and we can make it um, uh, happier, but you can never give up. You always have to keep plugging. Words of wisdom from the great Lee Steinberg. Lee, I want to thank you so much for joining me. Please hang with me one moment here as I sign off. Lee, uh, where can folks find you? Where can they connect with you? Where can they learn more? So I'm on all the social media. I uh, I tweet at Lee Steinberg. I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. And our, our website is uh, Steinberg Sports. So you can look for our agent academies and our uh, outreach educational programs cybersports.com will get you there and um, I'm always happy to hear from people uh, everybody listening I want to thank you so much for joining us and hanging us with us today on the podcast I really hope that you uh, take this one in 
words of wisdom and and really go, go deep and check out Lee's story. It's absolutely incredible. It's inspiring. He's a freaking legend. I'm grateful for him uh, spending time with all of us today. You know where to find out more at thepodcast.com. Remember, take care of each other. Look out for one another and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Take care, everybody. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.